Espionage is one of the oldest political and military arts, and is surprisingly well documented. The rise of the great ancient civilizations beget institutions and persons devoted to the security and preservation of their ruling regimes. Spies can be argued as an indispensable part of state security. Throughout history, intelligence has been defined as the collection, culling, analysis, and dissemination of critical and strategic information and its practice and implications are widely diverse. To start with some examples, Egyptian hieroglyphs reveal the presence of court spies, as do papyri describing ancient Egypt's extensive military and slave trade operations. Early Egyptian pharaohs employed agents of espionage to ferret out disloyal subjects and to locate tribes that could be conquered and enslaved. In the Middle East, and later Byzantium, the large government bureaucracy established one of the earliest civilian intelligence agencies. Civilian agents of espionage culled information about foreign militaries and economic practices from traders, merchants, sailors, and other businessmen. In other parts of the world, written records from the 5th century mention the use of spies in the Indus Valley 2,500 years ago. In China, Sun Tzu penned the comprehensive military treatise, The Art of War which contains several chapters devoted to the use of spies both on and off the battlefield. The Roman Empire is also a strong source for espionage and intelligence information. Rome's most famous case of espionage and intrigue culminated in the assassination of Julius Caesar on March 15, 44 BCE. Not all of the details of the assassination conspiracy have been collected or found by historians, but records have established that the Roman intelligence community knew of the plot and even provided information to Caesar or his assistants, providing the names of several conspirators. However, the information of the intelligence community was ignored. Information about the enemy and his situation could be received by reconnaissance. When one went oneself or sent forward cavalry, light-armed infantry, or swift scouting ships, openly to view the enemy. Or it might be discovered by espionage, if disguised or otherwise hidden agents worked in the territory held by the enemy. These agents, or spies, must either themselves bring their news through the enemy forces, or find some way to transmit their information. A special case arises when a position is under siege, and messages have to be sent through the besieging forces and their fortifications. It has been said that no plan survives contact with the enemy, and as a Greek put it, Generals will arrange their forces as they believe will be to their advantage. But when the storm of war comes upon them, often smashing and changing many things and breaking varied conditions, the sight of what happens before their eyes requires measures founded on the demands of the moment. The compulsion of chance rather than the recollection of experience suggests what they must do. Now what about the Greeks and their use of espionage tactics? Well, the early Greeks relied on deception as a primary means of achieving surprise attacks on their enemies. Between 1500 and 1200 BCE, Greece's many forces, with its regional rivals, led to the development of new military and intelligence strategies. And so renowned were these strategies that Greek literature from antiquity celebrated its intelligence and espionage exploits. The greatest example of this has to be the legendary incident of the Trojan Horse a wooden structure given to the city of Troy as a gift, but which contained several hundred Greek soldiers seeking safe entrance into the heavily fortified rival city. This example became the symbol of Greek intelligence prowess. In the era of democratic Greek city-states, espionage was chiefly employed as a political tool. The hints we get in Greek sources are confirmed under the Roman Empire, which had carefully organized its intelligence service. One example is a man named Procopius, who had been a notarius, a kind of state official that often acted as a spy or an informer, and in 365 CE he feared for his life and fled to a friend's estate in Chalcedon. From there he frequently entered and secretly wandered about Constantinople, and after the manner of a very skillful spy, undetected because of the filth and gauntness of his face, he used this to gather the rumors that were then becoming abundant. In a late treatise, it is remarked that spies will find markets good places in which to pick up information, because traders in all shapes and sizes can be found there, and it is easy to pass as one. 
This can be compared to spies in the late Roman Empire, who were recommended to live quietly among the lower elements in society to avoid detection. Spies were able to use insignificance as a protection factor. Slaves, who had little to lose, could have actually lived lives of duplicity, and could be good spies. Elaborate security precautions had to be put in place to secure against treachery. Aeneas Tacticus, one of the earliest Greek writers on the art of war, gives a long series of precautionary measures to be adopted on the outbreak of war. And here is a list of those that might especially affect spies. No festivals are to be held outside the city. No private gatherings are to be allowed by day or night, unless in special cases with permission in a public building or place. No common feasts are to be held except for weddings and funerals, and for them notice is to be given to the authorities. No one is to leave the city to join exiled citizens, or to have any communication with them. All these measures check the infiltration of spies and the organization of sedition. Incoming and outgoing foreign mail is to be censored by the state. No one is to sail abroad without a passport. Restrictions on mooring ships. This was to prevent illegal landing or boarding by spies, or surprise attacks from the ships. Aliens are to be disarmed on arrival. Aliens are to be lodged only with state permission and registers to be kept of their abodes. The authorities are to lock them in at night. Vagrants are to be expelled, and foreign students and others are to be registered. Restrictions on access to foreign ambassadors. The use of embassies for spying is notorious in modern times. Bounties for useful imports. Trade would afford opportunities for spies. Practice alarms and restrictions on foreigners during them. Curfew regulations. Rewards for informers. Ancient states relied heavily on informers to enforce law. The encouragement of informers inevitably encourages false accusations. The sycophants at Athens became notorious. And finally, prohibitions on lights at night. This was to prevent signaling. Legal provisions had to be supplemented by practical measures. The security of the city walls was crucial. Guards had many orders and directions to follow and had to be carefully selected, being people who were considered wise and sharp-witted. How to act on watch on gates and walls was very detailed, including what guards needed to watch out for, such as on night watches, where even the danger of sleep needed to be formally addressed, as guards were seen to be betraying the trust of the city and their fellow guards. Guards also portrayed their city in other ways, if involved in secret resistances. Aeneas Tacticus tells of a gatekeeper who, in the day, went to a well outside the walls for water. There, he left stones in a prearranged spot to indicate by an agreed code when, where, and with what detachment of guards he would be on duty during the night. So, the city was portrayed. With the frequent moving of friendly forces in the dark, passwords and countersigns were essential to tell friends from foes. The selection of suitable passwords was important, as under stress, unfamiliar words could be forgotten, or mercenary soldiers using different Greek dialects might unconsciously substitute from their own dialects words more familiar to them. Since in confusing situations, passwords can be easily overheard by the enemy, Often a visual sign or a special noise was required as an additional token of recognition, with whistling not recommended as it might lead to trouble from guard dogs. The use of written messages necessitated the development of codes, disguised writing, trick inks, and hidden compartments in clothing to carry messages. Egyptian spies were the first to develop the extensive use of poisons, including toxins derived from plants and snakes, to carry out assassinations or acts of sabotage. Communications of secret messages by Greeks were ingenious. Spies had numerous methods for hiding messages that consisted of either no secret message at all to outsiders, or messages that could not be read if intercepted. Here is an example of just a few. Messages could be written on leaves that were used medicinally to bind up a wound. Tiny rolls of inscribed lead foil could be used as a woman's earrings. Now, despite this example, there seems to be no hint of women spies anywhere else in existing literature. At least not what I have read. Papyrus could also be sewn into clothing. A thin piece of tin with a message engraved on it could be inserted between the layers in the sole of a letter bearer's sandal. When he's asleep, the message can then be removed. 
This kind of method needed a skillful stitcher in order to be effective. There's also one last method I want to touch on that is actually really intriguing. Herodotus tells of the tyrant, Histiaeus, at the Persian court who wished to send a message to his son-in-law, Aristagoras, in Miletus. He had a slave's head shaved and a message tattooed on the exposed scalp. When his hair had grown again, the slave was sent to Aristagoras and he was told to tell Aristagoras to shave his head. Then the message was revealed to him which was an injunction to revolt. Now with all of these acts, the Greeks, however, and espionage as a whole, could hardly admire the sneaking spy. He might be paid for his work, but it was too much to expect that his achievements would be admired and chronicled by historians, and the honorific decrees that survive in such great numbers on stone were not likely to praise him. While individual spies and their names are left in the dark to us, a lot of other areas are also in the shadows. For instance, how successful were spies? How far were they motivated by patriotism? Were there professional spies as there were mercenary soldiers? Or were they all amateurs acting only on special occasions? How were they recruited and trained, if trained at all? It's interesting to see if anything will turn up in the future, but if spies were good enough? That information may never surface, if it exists at all.